my name is Mithil Mehta. I'm an assistant professor of vitreoretinal surgery and diseases. And one of those diseases is diabetic retinopathy. And that's what I'm going to be talking today about. If I mumble, please let me know. I'm a mumbler. It's uh, a chronic problem. My wife gets on about on and on about that, but I can't really hear her because she mumbles too. Anyways, so we'll be talking about diabetic retinopathy. Diabetes can cause vision loss in a variety of ways. It can cause cataracts, which Dr. Wade will be talking about, ischemia or lack of blood flow. Neovascular glaucoma is a form of glaucoma that's caused by diabetes. This is when new blood vessels grow and they block the drainage canals from your eye and raises the pressure of your eye. And then diabetic retinopathy, which is what I'll be talking about today, because that's what I treat. Uh, diabetic retinopathy can cause vision loss in a variety of ways, from diabetic macular edema, which is swelling in the retina or the back of the eye, vitreous hemorrhage, which is bleeding inside of the eye, and traction or pulling on the retina. And I'll show you examples of these things. Mm -hmm. So diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in working age people in the United States. Even in patients who do everything right, at least 5% of the, these people would benefit from surgery. We're not talking about just treatments and medicines. We're talking about actual surgery from diabetic retinopathy. Our goal is to have patients have control of their A1C, the hemoglobin A1C level. It's a blood test your doctor will have you do every few months. It'll give us an idea of what the average sugar was over the previous three months. And our goal is less than 7.0%. That is the goal. Uh, there are some people out there who are aiming for less, and that'd be great, but we'll, we'll, we'll take seven, okay? We want to control the blood pressure and then not to smoke, because ultimately diabetes is a disease of blood vessels. So what happens is that the lining of the blood vessels in the eye becomes damaged by the diabetes. There are these cells that line the blood vessels called pericytes, and they die in diabetes, especially uncontrolled sugar part of diabetes. So when these pericytes die, the vessel walls become very weak and they leak into the retina and they cause it to swell. The body tries to fix this problem by growing new blood vessels. But like all new things and baby things, they don't work very well. They leak, they bleed, and then they scar and they can even pull on the retina and rip holes in it even. So this can cause blurry and distorted vision. So the symptoms. You can have diabetic retinopathy and not know it until it becomes advanced because it can start with your peripheral vision and you don't notice that you're losing vision out here because for most of the time you're focused on what's in front of you. So it's painless for the most part and early on this could be such a gradual process you may not notice your vision's bad until one day you're looking at a road sign and everyone else can see it and you can't. So we want to catch this stuff before it gets to that level. <clears throat> which is why your doctor will want you to have a diabetic eye exam at least once a year if you're a diabetic. This can happen, like I said, gradually or suddenly, and you can be blind in one or both eyes. So diabetic retinopathy is divided into two general types, the non-proliferative type and the proliferative type. In this context, proliferative means growing new blood vessels in the eye. You shouldn't be growing new blood vessels after birth, okay? Your eye is well-formed at birth and except in premature babies, you should not be growing new blood vessels. <clears throat> so the treatments typically involve controlling the blood sugar, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, and not smoking. Ultimately, no matter what I do to someone, surgery, lasers, injections, nothing's gonna matter if the sugar's not controlled because ultimately that's gonna be the end all. But if we can control the sugar, even still, that doesn't solve all the problems because oftentimes there were years of high sugars before we get it under control. And in type 2 diabetes, you could have type 2 diabetes for a decade without even knowing it. And finally gets diagnosed, you've already had so many years of damage to your blood vessels causing these problems. But here in the Eye Institute, we can treat it with eye injections of medicine, laser, or surgery. So this is a cross-section cartoon of a normal eye. This is like you're looking through my face this way. You see my eye this way, okay? This is a contact lens on it for some unknown reason. And uh, this is the cornea. This is the iris or the colored part of your eye, blue, uh, hazel, brown. This is the lens, the natural lens of the eye. And this is the important part. This is the retina. 
It lines the back wall of the eye and it connects to the optic nerve and goes into the brain. Technically, the retina is still part of the brain, actually. So this is all part of the brain here. It's all nerve tissue. And you want to keep nerves separate from blood because blood is directly toxic to nerves. So we want to try to minimize the bleeding inside of the retina. This big empty space here is called the vitreous cavity. And this area can be full of blood in diabetic retinopathy. So when I examine you, this is what I see. You can see the optic nerve right here. There's arteries in the lighter colored blood vessels here and veins in the darker colored blood vessels. This dark area here is called the foveal avascular zone because no big blood vessels are here, so they're not crowding your vision. And right there is the fovea, or the center of the vision. That's the most important part. So in the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you can see some changes. First of all, obvious is this big yellow ring of stuff. These are exudates. And right there, that little tiny spot there, is a little aneurysm that was leaking. And when it leaks blood, when the watery part of the blood goes away, the protein stays around. And that's what this exudates are. It's leftover protein from the blood. And you can see these little spots of blood everywhere, little hemorrhages kind of everywhere. This is affecting the patient's vision. We do this thing called the fluorescein angiogram, where I put an IV in your arm, inject a plant-based dye, and watch it flow through the blood vessels. We can do this without any radiation right here in the office downstairs. And this lets us look at all of the blood flow. And on this particular patient, you can see after 5 minutes and 26 seconds, you can see these little microaneurysms lighting up because the blood pools there and it doesn't really circulate. You can see areas here where there's no blood vessels, or there's no blood flow, ischemia. And you can see area where the, where the blood and the contrast dye leaked out everywhere. And this is what's called diabetic macular edema or swelling. So this is when we look at the eye. We can also look in cross-section of the eye. Just like an ultrasound, we have something called an OCT, optical coherence tomography. And this uses light like an ultrasound. So it bounces light waves at the eye, and you can see in cross-section across the eye. This bottom picture is a normal retina. The center is the foveal depression. You'll see it's missing these top layers up here. Kind of get them out of the way so you can cram in all these rods and cones, and you can have the highest acuity vision right here. From there to there is where all your reading vision lives. This distance is about 400 microns or 0.4 millimeters. So it's a tiny, tiny spot that's really, really vital to your vision. And you can see up here, this patient has diabetic macular edema. It has these giant spaces full of fluid here. And it's kind of elevated and pointed up like a mountain instead of a, a little valley here. So this patient's vision is not very good because of this diabetic macular edema. So to treat diabetic macular edema, we inject medications in the eye. We do lasers sometimes, but injections nowadays are the more uh, preferred method because it leads to quicker vision recovery uh, and less scarring later on. We inject these medications directly into the white of the eye through the pars plana right here because you can see there's a gap where there's no retina here. And so we can enter the eye safely here. And we could also inject underneath the eye. Now this sounds really scary to anyone who's never had an injection in the eye. You know the old uh, place, play yard thing, you know, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. But I actually stick needles in people's eyes every day. Uh, I'm in here at work, I, I did a few today. And it's not as bad as it sounds because we numb the eye so you don't feel pain. The numbing medicine burns a little bit, but after that then you don't feel the injection actually going inside of the eye. Sometimes we'll inject underneath or behind the eye if we don't want to inject inside of the eye. The typical injections we give most commonly, we give something called anti-VEGF injections. VEGF is the vasoendothelial growth factor. This is a factor that your body creates to grow new blood vessels. Your ischemic retina, your retina that doesn't have enough blood flow because of the diabetic damage to the blood vessels, your body asks for more blood vessels by releasing this molecule called VEGF. And these are all medications that block VEGF. Some of these medications are used for not just diabetes as well. Uh, AMD, or macular degeneration, and vein occlusions. These other medicines are used for, for these as well. We also can inject steroids in or around the eye. Uh, subtenons means below or around the eye. And these intravitreal ones are inside of the eye. 
One of these is a, a medicine, triamcinolone. It's got a bunch of white crystals in it. So if you inject it in your eye, it can, you can see all these floaters. But it's the least expensive of these three by probably a factor of 10. And so a lot of the times we'll start with one of these. But this Ozudex and these Eluvians are little pellets that are sustained release medications to, to slowly release some steroid into the eye. This Ozudex implant will last three to five months. This Eluvian implant will last two to three years. Why may you ask would I not use a two to three year one? Well, first of all, this implant never completely degrades. So it will always leave a little thing floating your eye forever. Number two, it costs $10,000 for the medication. So we don't always want to jump to that, right? We want things to work as inexpensively as possible and effectively as possible. So we don't, we don't jump to this necessarily. But these other medicines work as well. So with all these treatments, we also do laser treatment. So this is a patient who had type 1 diabetes, uh, was not controlling their blood sugar, and if you can see here, there's some really fine, lacy blood vessels. These are neovascular membranes, okay? So this patient was scheduled for laser. Uh, we do this laser procedure. We laser the peripheral retina, which doesn't affect the central vision, but it can make night vision a little bit worse. But the goal is to save the eye. This patient didn't show up for that appointment, so the eye filled up with blood. They couldn't see anything. So this eye is totally full of blood. We have to do surgery to remove this blood. We did an ultrasound just to make sure the retina was okay underneath there. And you can see all of this blood inside of the eye here. If you can imagine that little drawing of the retina around this, or the eyeball, cornea is up here in the front. And this is that big vitreous cavity space full of blood here. This is another patient uh, who had proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is one of those fluorescein angiograms again. You can see all of these neovascular membranes are lighting up. And all of this peripheral retina is dead. It's not having any response, any, any uh, blood flow to it. You can see these big blood vessels are working, but all the capillaries in between are gone. So we also have this OCT scan. The little dip is not there, but there aren't big cysts, so the vision is not terrible, 2060. Patient could drive during daytime, but not, not so much at night. So we did laser treatment. But despite laser treatment, they still got worse. And they developed this scar tissue membrane from this little frond over here that was pulling on the retina, kind of like a trampoline, making it tight. And you can see now there's all these cysts in the retina. So the vision got, got really bad. Count fingers vision, meaning they could not see the big E on the chart. So we did surgery, and we removed all of these membranes, put in some more laser, and uh, we removed the vitreous to get into that spot. And the patient had complete restoration of the vision, 2060 back again. Um, and we were able to get the patient back to where they were. Uh, and this is, this is an excellent result. We can do this now because we have much smaller instruments now, much finer instruments. We've gotten better at these techniques. And so with this level of success, uh, our goal is to not have to get to this point, right? And that's why we want to control our sugars. But if we do, if we can treat it quickly, we can fix things before there's permanent damage. So our goal is to have better control. We have better medicines, tools, and technology, and our end result for better vision. Any questions? Not 100%. Like I said, 5% of perfect patients who do everything right still end up in the situation where they need surgery. They usually don't need surgery for something this bad. Oftentimes it's just bleeding in the back of the eye and not necessarily tractional membranes or ischemia. Sometimes they bleed and they need lasers. But for the most part, that is true. I have seen 90-year-old type 1 diabetics uh, who did not have any diabetic retinopathy at all. Meaning they're, they're diabetic when they're seven years old they control their sugar for the next 83 years, and they're fine. I never thought I'd see that, because back when I was in medical school, we didn't have type 1 diabetics who were well controlled very well, very often. For the most part, if you have one or two or three or four floaters, for the vast majority of people, that just means you've had enough birthdays to develop floaters. It is a totally normal condition. 
Uh, it's a sign of maturity uh, and intelligence, I think. And so uh, it's, it's one of these things that, you know, that people just develop floaters over time because that vitreous jelly, that big open space, when you're young, it's solid. And as you get older, it becomes more and more liquid. And then it separates from the back wall of the eye. And where it was connected before is a little bit of scar tissue that you see kind of floating around. In up to a third of patients, that is true. With some of these medications, this is why we have, they've developed these other medications. Um, I'm not trying to advertise them, but they work, so we use them. Uh, let me get back to that point. Here we go. So <clears throat> this tr was a huge problem with just these triamcinolone injections because uh, this can make the pressure shoot up very, very high. Uh, with these other medications, they're much smaller doses in a very sustained release level. And so even if the pressure does rise up, oftentimes we can control it with just eye drops. And two thirds of patients don't have a problem. So it's one of those things where I don't use steroids first line, um, basically for anybody, but uh, these other medications work really well uh, for diabetic macular edema. But sometimes they just don't work after a while and you need to add some steroids on board as well. Plus, steroids also have a small anti-VEGF effect as well, which is helpful. They've been trying to get these in an eye drop form. It does not work. They've tried other medications to get this in, in a pill form. It doesn't work. These, this first, this bottom one here, Avastin, is, is off-label, actually, for use in the eye. It's not FDA approved for use in the eye. However, every insurance company wants you to use this one first because this one and this one cost 50 times as much. And so this company that makes the Lucentis makes the Vastin for colon cancer and breast cancer. So they have to make big vials of it for colon cancer. And even still, they charge $100,000 for those. But if you break this down up into 0 0.05 ml injections, you can make a lot of injections out of one vial. And so that's, that's what we do. We have a, a compounding pharmacy that, that does this for us in a sterile environment. Uh, and it saves people a lot of money, especially on the co-pays. And it works for non-proliferative for diabetic macular edema as well, because the same factor, VEGF, can cause leaking of the swelling in the eye. So even in non-proliferative. 